Hello everyone, I'm Brian Barcelona and you're watching The Good News. Today we're gonna join Daniel Kalinda's live studio audience as he brings another powerful message in his Live Before You Die series. I'm sure you're gonna be blessed. Don't forget to join us tomorrow and the rest of this week. I can't wait to share my heart with you right here on The Good News. Previously on Live Before You Die. I think that many times people haven't discovered God's will simply because they're afraid to. Subconsciously they think, well, what if God calls me to do something I don't want to do? What if God calls me to do something that means I have to give up my hopes and dreams? I've heard people teach about God's will, and some of them always emphasize the hardship, the difficulty, the, the sacrifice. Instead, the ones that I've observed that are effective are the ones that are doing something they enjoy so much, it seems effortless. When God's gift and grace are resting on a person's life for a certain task, that person is able to do with joy what would seem difficult or even impossible to others. Hello everyone and welcome back to our in-depth study on discovering and fulfilling God's will for your life based on my book, Live Before You Die. I'm Daniel Kalenda and today our journey continues with a question that's haunted many people throughout the centuries. The question is, what if I've already missed the will of God? Well, my friend, if you're one of those that's blown it, if you feel like you've messed up too much or failed too much, then this is especially for you today. Now, if you've never blown it, well, first of all, I'd like to shake your hand, and then I'd like to invite you to actually attempt something, because you're probably one year old, but the reality is that whether we're willing to admit it or not, we've all missed God's will at some point in our lives. In fact, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe you say, well, that's only for sinners, but the truth is that even after we're saved and after we're born again into God's family, we still miss the mark from time to time. So what should we do when we miss God's will? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about today. But first, we're going to begin as we always do by asking God for his help and grace and by committing our ways to him. So let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, I present myself to you today as a living sacrifice. Because you gave your son for me, I give myself to you fully. This is my reasonable service. I lay my dreams and desires at your feet and ask that your will would be done in my life. Use my mortal hands to build your eternal kingdom. Use my life to propel your purpose forward. In Jesus' name, amen. My dad was faithful all the years to preach, you know, the cross and preach about Jesus, the only way, the truth and the life. And that was my background as a child, just being around the presence of God. I'd had the most godly upbringing a child could have. And yet in my heart, I began, my eyes began to wander. My heart began to wander from God. Just, I, I slowly began to go astray where my friends were doing certain things and, and my life drifted along with those people. Um, I, I began to be tempted in, in certain areas. Coming from brokenness, pain and ashes. I mean, I went through so much that I, at a given time I didn't even ever think that God would use me for anything. I was in pieces, you know, having a broken family and broken marriage, and everything fell apart in my life. I, it seemed like there was no end to the problems. I lost everything, my home, the house, everything that I ever used to see, this is mine. One day I woke up with nothing, nowhere to stay, no nothing, no my family, nothing. The lowest point for me, I was in the pigsty. I was in the pig pen. I was in, I remember being in a club, I'd taken alcohol, I'd, I'd consumed certain drugs and, and my body was having some kind of allergic reaction. 
And I knew in that moment that my life, I felt the presence of evil all around me. And for those that don't know what I mean, I felt almost demonic spirits all around me, just really vying for my life. In that moment, from deep within me, I, I couldn't even open my mouth, but a cry from within my, my being. I just cried the name of Jesus. And it was almost immediately, I felt the presence of God come to me. Right in the midst of, of that club, of that dark place, I felt the presence of God come to me and every symptom began to lift from me. God began to draw me back. It was at that appointed time when I, I was in ashes that uh, Pastor Bonke came for his first crusade in Nairobi. That's back in 1988. That's 25 years ago. And uh, for the first time, I saw him preach and I said, wow, now I think I see something, a light shining at the end of the tunnel. And I chose, I made a decision. You know, sometimes in life we have to make decisions. I chose to rise up, stand, take a breath and face the day. And there I started a new day. I sensed that I had received something from God that money would never buy. So I knew that I had the most, the treasure that I needed in life. And that was God's grace and God's anointing. When I look back today and I see where God has taken me from, and where he's brought me to, all I can do is worship him and praise him. Has, I have to give him all the glory because it was nothing to me. And that's the power of the blood of Jesus, that he takes a life that's a mess and he puts those robes of righteousness and he makes us a son. And uh, what a powerful, powerful, powerful message that is. What, what happened is I, I knew the microphone was not an instrument to defend myself. It was to exhort Christ because he said, if I be lifted up, I would draw men unto myself. And I did exactly that. I preached Christ. Signs, miracles happening day after day. And that was like an explosion. God is going to give you beautiful ashes. Forget about the past. The Bible says, do not consider the things of the past. It's a new day. Rise up on your feet. Reach out to those things that are ahead of you. It's never too late. You know, Jesus Christ came and shed his blood. And at the heart of it, at the very foundation of the gospel is restoration. You know, one of the greatest lies that the devil will tell someone is there is no way back. And yet the heartbeat, the very foundation of the gospel is restoration. That you can go from that pigsty, as we say, from that place of sin and bondage and shame and guilt and be restored back to the Father. And there are many today that keep running and the more they think about coming home, the more they feel the guilt and the more they run into sin and to bondage and to the same old life. But I pray that as people listen to this, something will break in their hearts, that they realize that God is not wake, waiting with a stick. He's waiting with loving arms to embrace them and to put those robes of righteousness that they don't have to look at the past anymore. The past will be gone and the new destiny that God has for their lives will begin to open up as they walk with Christ. And that is the greatest joy, is to walk in the presence of God all the rest of your life. Amen, isn't that wonderful? You know, we often hear testimonies from people who didn't know the Lord and then they got saved and their lives changed. And as the old saying goes, they lived happily ever after. But these testimonies that you just heard are from two very close friends of mine who were already saved. And then they fell away to such a degree that they didn't think that God would ever take them back again. They didn't think God could salvage the wreckage of their lives. But yet somehow, God was able to take their mess and turn it into a miracle of his amazing grace and mercy. Remember the story of the prodigal in the Bible that, that Nathan just talked about? Notice it's not called the story of the prodigal stranger. It's called the story of the prodigal son. It was the prodigal son that was sitting in the pigsty 
wondering if his father would ever take him back again. It was the prodigal son that wondered if there was any hope for his life. And it was the prodigal son that the father ran to with open arms, welcoming him home. I love what it says in Revelation 13, verse 8, where it describes Jesus as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Think for just a moment what this actually means. It means that this whole plan of salvation that we know about was not God's plan B. It was planned from the very beginning. God was not taken off guard when man fell in the Garden of Eden. He already knew that it was going to happen. He had already made provision for it, and he had already set in motion a plan that would culminate with the cross. When Adam and Eve partook of that forbidden fruit, which was arguably the most epic failure in history, God wasn't surprised. In fact, their failure had already been factored into his plan and provision had already been made for their redemption. So my friend, if you have failed, be encouraged by this thought. Before God called you, before you were saved, in fact, before you were even born, God knew exactly how your life would play out. Before you'd even made one mistake, God took all your future failures into account. And in his infinite wisdom and love, he preempted your blunders with a plan to turn your tragedy into a triumph in the end. My friend, with this knowledge, you can be confident that if you are still breathing right now, it's not too late for God to intervene and restore what the locusts and the canker worm have eaten. Now, having said these things, it's important for me to to make clear that disobedience is not a trivial matter, and I am not trying to trivialize it. God's grace does not guarantee that we'll never have to live with the negative consequences of our actions. In fact, many times, even though God forgives and restores, there are still scars that remain from disobedience. And often the process of correcting our mistakes can be a long and painful one, at least longer than it would have been had we obeyed. For example, you know the story of Jonah. He was called to go to Nineveh. The best way would have obviously been by ship. But because he disobeyed, he chose the hard way instead. And although he did ultimately make it to Nineveh, by the time he arrived, he he arrived, he had been through a storm, he'd been thrown off a ship, he'd been swallowed by a fish, he spent three days inside the fish, and then was vomited out on the beach. Yeah, Jonah made it to Nineveh all right, but the first option would have definitely been a better one. So my friend, this is a serious matter that we're talking about here. It's very important. If you've missed the perfect will of God in your life, I'm going to give you five steps that you need to take right away. And the first step is so simple, it will almost seem like an insult to your intelligence. Stop. If you are going in the wrong direction, my friend, before you do anything else, you need to stop. Now, as obvious and as elementary as this sounds, it is a real issue. You know, if we feel we've blown it, sometimes there's a temptation just to keep going. People who are trying to lose weight on a strict diet struggle with this all the time. Maybe they were doing really good for a few weeks. They lost a few pounds, and then a holiday came. They ruined their diet for a few days in a row. They gain a few pounds back, and then rather than stopping the downward spiral, they say, what's the use? I've already blown it. They just give in, and they just give up. My friend, listen, if you are on the wrong track right now, you need to realize that every day you continue on that path, is a day you will never get back. Don't waste one more day or one more hour moving in the wrong direction. Stop now in Jesus' name. Step number two is that you need to acknowledge your mistake. You know, I'm I'm never ceased to be amazed at the people in this world that just cannot seem to admit when they're wrong. They're always making excuses for themselves and justifying themselves and blaming everyone else, blaming their childhood, blaming their parents, blaming where they grew up, all these different places to place the blame. And these people will never get the victory in their lives until they learn to take responsibility for their mistakes and admit when they're wrong. Even if your mistake wasn't intentional, you still need to acknowledge it. Maybe it was a job you shouldn't have taken. Maybe it was a a bad investment that you got involved in or a debt that you couldn't afford. Maybe it was something that happened as a result of carelessness or neglect, or maybe it was actually caused by outright rebellion against God. Whatever the case may be, there is still redemption and grace for everyone that will humble themselves and admit when they're wrong. I love what it says in 1 John 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice it says that he's not only faithful, but also righteous. Why does it say he's righteous? Because Jesus paid the price for your forgiveness. And for God to forgive you is righteous for him to do. It's just for him to do. So step one is that if you're going in the wrong direction, you need to stop. Step two is you need to acknowledge your mistake. And step three is that you need to repent. Now, I want to take some time on this third step because I think that repentance is such an often misunderstood concept. In fact, many of you, as soon as you heard me say the word repentance, you automatically think you know what I'm going to say and you already put me into a category. I think sometimes we think that repentance is just for those that are committing gross sins and living in blatant rebellion against God. My friend, I want you to know something today. Repentance is for all of us. In fact, for the child of God, repentance should be a lifestyle. I believe this is one of the great keys to living a victorious Christian life. And I want to help you understand repentance today in a way that perhaps may be new to many of you. And I want to illustrate it by using a visual aid, a little compass. How many of you know how a compass works? A compass doesn't shout out to you and tell you all the different ways you shouldn't go. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't make that turn. It's, it's actually very quiet. It only tells you one direction. It points one direction. It points north. And by knowing which direction is north, a traveler is able to find his way. But if that compass is going to be able to help you, you have to constantly realign yourself with it. That means constantly turning or constantly repenting. And listen, for a traveler in the wilderness, this is not a trivial matter at all. It's actually a matter of life and death. For hundreds of years, explorers have conquered vast, seemingly impenetrable wildernesses with a simple but vital instrument, a compass. She will rebuke a traveler often. She will correct him a thousand times, but she is no enemy. She is a faithful friend. For without her, a wanderer would lose his way every hour. Through small, constant, incremental adjustments, the weary traveler corrects his course. Even in the fiercest storm, the thickest forest, or the darkest night, her uplifted hands will keep him true if he will continue to heed her silent voice. Through her instruction, the traveler is fixed and focused on a singular motivation. His heart is set on his desired destination. He is not tempted by the wrong path, and he's not struggling to escape it. He moves toward his goal with his eyes on the prize, and every dead end is automatically evaded. The word repent means to turn. Now in this treacherous place, far from the raspy voice of the inner city street preacher shouting, turn or burn. Here, on a perilous journey through an unforgiving wilderness, we will learn what it means to repent. Repentance is not only for rebels. It is also the habit of the righteous. It is the continual turning of a soul, avoiding sin not by focusing on it, but by perpetually recalibrating the heart with eyes fixed on the prize, Jesus Christ himself. The finger of the Holy Spirit is ever pointing the child of God northward to Christ. He is not an angry street preacher. 
He is a faithful friend who keeps us aligned with the will of God if we will hear his voice and respond to his correction. So turn today, turn now, turn every hour if necessary. Maybe only one degree or two is needed to realign your course, but turn just the same. Turn to Jesus, for in heaven or on earth, there is no other way. You know, a compass is an amazing tool but it only works if you pay constant attention to it and allow it to constantly correct you. You know, I've used compasses in underwater scuba diving navigation, and this is actually much more difficult than using a compass on land because when you're under the water and you can only see a few feet in front of you, the only thing you can rely on is that compass. And you don't have any landmarks, mountains or trees that you can set your sights on. And sometimes when you're underwater, you feel like you've been moving in a straight line and you become a little bit self-confident and you accidentally forget about the compass. Now, this is a good way to get completely lost because without fail, if you've forgotten to look at the compass for a little while, when you remember to look at it again, you will discover that you are going in completely the wrong direction. The compass requires you to constantly turn, to adjust, to modify your course, to align yourself with the right direction. You know, I've heard a lot of people preach on repentance over the years, and usually the preacher will emphasize a few particular sins that he feels are especially grievous. And he'll implore the people to turn away from those sins. Turn or burn, the classic repentance message. And often repentance is characterized as meaning a complete 180 degree turn into the opposite direction. Now there's nothing necessarily wrong with this or inaccurate, but I think that viewing repentance this way could cause people to miss something very important. In fact, it might be missing the real point altogether. For example, a sinner could turn away from sin and actually still be lost. In fact, there are many religions that teach morals and abstinence from, from many different kinds of sins that are even more strict than Christianity. But that, in and of itself, does not save anybody. In fact, the Bible teaches that nobody can be saved by works, not good or bad. So from the Christian perspective, what you turn away from is not what is most important. It's what you turn to that makes the real difference. Now, you see, if we only think of repentance as a 180 degree turn in the opposite direction, then we think that repentance is only for the rebellious, blatant sinner. And we fail to understand that sometimes, even for an obedient child of God, a minor but crucial fine-tuning is necessary to keep our hearts calibrated with the heart of God. If I'm hiking through the wilderness and I look at my compass and I realize that I'm only two degrees off course, I don't turn 180 degrees and go in the other direction. But I still need to turn. Even if it's only a slight adjustment, I need to align myself with the right direction. This is why I say that repentance is the practice of the righteous. We need to constantly turn our hearts back to God from darkness to light, from the flesh to the spirit, from the temporal to the eternal, from death unto life. And with this understanding, repentance takes on a whole new meaning. If I have lusted or lied, if I have bitterness in my heart or if I've missed God's will because of disobedience, yes, I need to repent, but I'm not just repenting or turning away from those sins. I realize that those sins are actually a symptom of a deeper and more serious problem, which is that I am moving in a direction that is contrary to Christ. That means that I need to refocus my heart. I need to recalibrate myself so that my whole being is once again aligned with Him. We see God's response to a repentant sinner when we look at the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. The father is waiting for his son to come home. And when the son comes home, he doesn't say, what do you do, you jerk, you, you're so stupid. Get away from me, you're not my son anymore. No, he welcomes him back, and in fact, he celebrates his return. That's the father's heart towards us when we come in real repentance.
we need to recognize when Jesus died for you and for me, he already knew every sin we were ever going to commit. Not just the sins we committed before we were saved, but the sins we would commit after we were saved. And even on our very best day, we still fall short. We still need mercy. We need to start with the recognition that God loves us as his children and has brought us to himself and he desires to be with us. And the worst day we've ever had, when we've sinned grievously and really blown it, he's saying, come back to me. Not so he can heap condemnation on us, but so he can restore us. And if he disciplines us, it's for our own goods that we can share in his holiness. Condemnation says you are guilty, go away from me. Conviction says you have sinned, come near to me. The Father is always calling you back. Christians need to repent probably every day of their lives. It doesn't mean grovel, it doesn't mean beat themselves, but Jesus says in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love are rebuke and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. So repentance can be over the course of the day when I realize I thought a wrong thought. I realized I was neglectful in prayer. I realized I was unkind towards someone. I realized I I had a lustful glance. Father, I'm sorry, that's not who I am. I turn from that in Jesus' name and we go forward. So this is part of our life and it's it's something that helps us walk in intimacy with God because we're not gonna let anything stand in the way of our fellowship with Him. Hello everybody, thank you for watching Good News, our new series exclusive to God TV. You know, the good news is only news if we share it. And it's only good if it's changing lives. As disciples of Jesus, as his messengers, we must tell the world of his great love for them. His love saves, his love redeems, his love is higher than all of the governments of this earth. This is our good news and we must preach it. You can help us to share the good news by simply supporting the broadcast of God TV. Did you know that God TV is reaching over 280 million homes globally, even airing in closed nations? But we need to expand the broadcast so that every nation and every home can hear the message of Jesus Christ. I'm asking you to please go online to god.tv slash good news to help support this must be heard message. Thank you for being a part of the global media mission field and thank you for watching.